For any educator, it's so important to create classrooms that are engaging and interactive. In STEM education, there are countless tools and strategies to help students see the applications of what they are learning. Today on ASWE TV, we are learning about all the creative ways to engage students in hands-on learning. Hi, I'm Joe Bethiathel, back for another episode of ASWE TV. We have got a great show ahead of us today, packed with great insights from leaders in engineering education and some quick glimpses into some of this year's most exciting sessions. These are just powerful tools. And the engineers of the future need to be able to collaboratively work together with these powerful tools. And with that, the human side, the empathy, and again, the ethics of how to use those powerful tools is very, very important. ASWE CEO Jacqueline L. Sayed will sit down to talk about how emerging novel tech with help from the society's industry partners can create more exciting and engaging classrooms. Engineers know when you go to work, you will work, you have to work as a team. Uh, and this gives these students the opportunity to kind of see where they would fit in the team, you know. Are they a leader? Are they a builder? Are they a designer? Are they good with software, hardware? We'll stop by the 26th annual two-year college model design competition to see students beaver bots in action. I think we've gotten so much more inclusive about who comes to engineering. And to close out our show, plenary speaker Jayati Murthy is stopping by the studio to reflect on her career across industry and academia. Plus, we'll visit three university programs across the country who are giving their students amazing interactive opportunities for hands-on STEM learning. You won't want to miss a thing in today's episode, so let's make sure you know exactly where to find us. You can keep watching ASWE TV on screens around the Oregon Convention Center, in your room at select hotels, on the ASWE 2024 annual meeting website, and on YouTube and X, formerly known as Twitter. First off today, we are taking an exclusive look into Carlotta Berry's session on flower bots. Let's see how she is giving educators the tools to teach robotics in an accessible and cost-effective manner. Even educational robotics can be very expensive, two to three hundred dollars. Robotics competitions can be in the thousands for kids to participate. So if you're from an under-resourced area, it's very difficult to get involved. And even if we get past the cost, sometimes there's a knowledge barrier. You just may not have teachers or adults in your area who know enough about electronics, mechanics, and software to be able to help you with robotics projects. I have created an open source robot that is mostly 3D printed, which means it's low cost. And because it's open source, that means it takes care of the access problem where anyone who can get to the internet and can get to YouTube can look at how to make their own robot, print it and program it. So I came up with this idea because it was a way to get teachers and communities like Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts and things like that into robotics without them having to break the bank. What they're going to learn today is how the 3D printed robot was made as well as how to convert it as your skill level improves. So we're going to start with graphical programming like Make your Blockly by using Make Micro Bits and then we're going to move on to Arduino Uno which is text based. So as we're changing the controller on the robot it's going from K-12 elementary to college level, university level and maybe even graduate school so that one robot is growing with you as your skills improve. No matter what your area is, because robotics is multidisciplinary, you will now be able to use that whether you are in computer science, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, social psychology, human-robot interaction. You can use it to touch on your field in order to teach people more about artificial intelligence and about what you want them to know just by using that same robot. Carlotta's session highlights an important point for STEM educators. To bring in more talent to engineering, we need to make these concepts feel accessible and tangible. Northwestern and Purdue have joined forces to do just that. Let's see how their program IQ Park is introducing quantum mechanics concepts to a wider audience by highlighting its applications in the everyday. The mission of IQ Park is to demystify uh, quantum concepts. These quantum concepts can be confusing can be counterintuitive and that increases the barrier to entry to this kind of concepts. Our mission is to lower the barrier so students at different levels can learn something from it and can contribute to the development of the technology itself. What I try to do to make these quantum concepts accessible to everybody who's curious about it, and I mean everybody, curious people of all ages, is I try to bring it back to things you already know. So I use a lot of analogies between the strange quantum world that you don't yet know 
and the things in your life that you do already know. The other thing I try to do is show you places in your life where you already have quantum mechanics that you can hold in your hands. It is fascinating to introduce these ideas uh, to younger students because, you know, the quantum ideas typically do not align with the everyday observations. So they are different than the classical physics, they are different than the Newtonian mechanics, which we experience and observe at this macro level. So we try to bring attention to the community and make sure that the students and learners and general public do have access to that knowledge and also would appreciate that and would pay attention to this going forward. Keeping pace with rapidly accelerating technology is a daunting task for educators to take on, but at the same time, when used effectively, technology can help demystify engineering and keep students at every level interested and engaged. So joining me now to discuss this is ASWE CEO Jacqueline El Sayed. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, my pleasure. So we've heard a lot in the last year about the growth of artificial intelligence in every industry and in education in particular. Uh, we're seeing more of it being used in education, you know, in classrooms. Has that been a challenging transition for educators? Um, I would say yes, uh, although because we're engineers, right, we're used to using technology and one of the things that happens all, all the time is that technology is rapidly and more rapidly changing. So um, I would say that AI is kind of divided into two areas of, that faculty are concerned about. One is just the ethics of it, because um, by using AI in the classroom, students might be having assistance, right? Uh, and so they have to learn how to be able to provide notation so that they're not taking that credit for that. And that is a, a quite a, a huge issue for faculty. But the other part is just these are just powerful tools. And the engineers of the future need to be able to collaboratively work together with these powerful tools. And with that, the human side, the empathy, and again, the ethics of how to use those powerful tools is very, very important. That's been incorporated into the engineering classroom. Uh, and But it also allows for students to be able to explore, and engineers in particular love to explore and tinker and I think so. I think it's very positive. And so, how does ASWE's industry partnerships help uh, educators with these changes, implementing these changes? Sure. ASWE has something called the Corporate Members Council, and these are members of industry who are particularly focused on um, engineering education. Um, and we have quite a few uh, work that we do with them. For example, we had an initiative called the Future Ready Engineering Ecosystem, where we brought together uh, corporate members and uh, educators to really discuss what will be the changes and what will a future engineer look like. So what does future engineering look like? And what it does, what one of the outcomes is really that engineers and corporations will need to work together as technology changes so rapidly. And you've talked about the future of engineering. We've talked in the last year, several years, about an engineer shortage. So using this new technology, can that help kind of demystify engineering, bring new people into the fold and hopefully get us out of the shortage? That's true. Um, because technology is changing, that means we even need more and more, that the shortage is even increasing, right? Um, and so I would say that demystifying engineering through AI-type tools could start in K-12, right? Because those students that are interested in engineering can tinker uh, and, and, and try things out. And that really gets them interested, but also does demystify because one of the barriers is that um, students don't really know what engineering, what do, what do engineers do, right? It, it's just, it, it's, it, it is unknown. So be, being able to try things out, look at things, um, and uh, see what engineers really do, I think that's how I became an engineer, and future engineers would also be doing that. How does ASWE help educators that want to implement this new technology in their classrooms? Well, what, what we really do here is, those are our members, right? K-12, higher ed, um, faculty and administrators, that is really what makes ASWE unique. 
Uh, and so we provide professional development. Uh, we have conferences like this. We have divisions, which are community practices, which the educators can discuss together. And that's really helps our, ed our faculty then uh, try out new things, learn, and, and discuss things together. And so that is really what, really, that community practice and the, um, the community that a ASW brings together is really what makes um, educators thrive. Well, it's a brave, exciting new world for all of us. Jacqueline, I say thank you for your time. My pleasure. Creating engaging learning environments is key to getting students motivated about their studies. Let's head to Virginia Commonwealth University's College of Engineering. Their focus on experiential learning gives students the skills they need to jump into their careers. The objectives primarily are focused on preparing a workforce for the grand challenges of the 21st century. And in doing that, providing a unique applied platform of experiential knowledge to the students so that they can contribute immediately to companies and other institutions. A lot of our students, they actually are able to get really well paying internships, co-op positions, and so forth throughout the community. It's not only in the state of Virginia, but it goes outside the state. And a lot of feedback we get is the skill sets that they've developed in our programs are very strong, highly appreciative. We're gonna keep growing, bringing in more research, and continue to do our very best to educate our students and put those students in careers that are gonna make them happy, that's focused on engineering, and we're gonna keep moving forward in a positive light. Access to quality information is absolutely vital to STEM research and education, and that just would not be possible without the help of our engineering libraries. Let's hear from Chelsea Leachman, who stopped by to tell us all about how the ASWE supports libraries, librarians, and the people who use their services. Yeah, uh, libraries are integral to engineering education. We really work with faculty and students during, a lot of times, their design projects as far as um, understanding what information they need and then acquiring access to that information and then introducing them to lots of information sources, so beyond the journals and books, um, technical reports and standards that they need to complete their projects. As the information landscape is changing, our division really is trying to keep up with that. The librarians here really try to introduce other librarians to that concept and what's happening, um, new activities, new topics, and so it's really a place to learn and share from each other. And then a lot of times we end up working together um, across universities as well, so it's a, a great place to collaborate with colleagues. Librarians are partners with faculty, and that's why non-librarians would join, is that it's, it's, we, it's really a partnership between librarians and faculty. Um, without the faculty, we couldn't do what we do as well, so um, I think that's a great partnership uh, as a whole conference. Thanks, Chelsea, for that insight on the important role of ASWE's Engineering Library Support Division. We're starting to wind down today's episode, but it's not quite over yet. Before we see a showdown between Beaver bots and sit down with Jayathi Murthy, we're visiting two colleges focused on laying a strong foundation for their students. Let's head to Michigan Technological University to see how their Department of Engineering Fundamentals is laying down building blocks for the process of lifelong learning. With the College of Engineering at Michigan Tech, one of the unique things that we do is we have a common first year engineering program. And so what does that mean? So that means that all incoming students uh, really experience the same fundamental or foundational uh, learning experience. We are going through a general education reform right now and we've rebranded it. No longer are we calling it Gen Ed, we're calling it Essential Ed because not only does an engineer need to have you know, the technical skills, but they need all the other skills uh, in life. And that's really what I'm excited about, to see these students and how our essential education integration is really going to support these students, not only as they are students, but as they progress and continue their, their lifelong learning and education outside of Michigan Tech. Next up, we have Clemson University's Department of Civil Engineering. They have modeled their undergraduate curriculum after the construction of an archway. Let's see how their focus in project-based learning is keeping their students engaged. 
The first blocks that you lay in an arch construction are called the springers, and these are the two first classes that the students will take in their sophomore year. And so we've been focusing on the engagement of students in class in a project-based learning environment where they are applying all of the professional skills and teamwork approaches to problems that they'll be using in industry. The second series of courses kind of in the middle years of the program are called studio courses. And in the studio courses, we are looking at kind of moving the student from the conceptual phase of a project into more of the preliminary design phase. And the last block to form the arch is going to be the keystone. This is the culminating design experience class. And through this class, they're going to formalize themselves as professional engineers. And it's gonna give them that experience that is true to what they're going to see in the workforce. We're here now at ASWE's 26th annual two-year college model design competition. Students from all across the country are here to show off the beaver bots they designed and built. It's all coming down to this right here in the exhibit hall. Let's go. When students first decide to be an engineer in high school, they make that choice because they want to design something or build something, something cool and interesting, right? And then they go to school and their first semester, second semester in school, what are they doing? They're in calculus, they're in physics, right? They're maybe an intro to engineering class. They don't get to see that, that end, you know, job, that, that thing that they're going to be doing as, at, as an engineer, right, in the end. So um, a competition like this gives them the opportunity to, you know, go through a full design process. Just learning and just having the team together, um, it's been a long process, even though it's been a short time, but I think all of us had a lot of fun just trying to get it to work as best we can. There's 12 trees, and the trees are represented by popsicle sticks set around the track. Um, and the task is to take the trees and chop them down and put them in a pond, kind of like a beaver pond, if you will. So we have a river and a pond. Um, the robot has to be autonomous, so they can't, uh, uh, it, it, there's no remote control, so they push one button and they have to uh, go ahead and finish. Um, they get 120 seconds to complete the task, and there's various points that they can get along the way. So if they just knock the tree down, but they don't pick it up and put it in the pond, they get points. If they push it into the river, they get points. To get the maximum points, they put the trees in the pond itself, so they'll get the most points there. Just focusing on actually starting to create it, we spent a very long time with ideas and trying to get things to go and actually start working, make a cohesive bot was our most challenging thing. The engineers know when you go to work, you will work you have to work as a team. Uh, and this gives these students the opportunity to kind of see where they would fit in the team, you know? Are they a leader? Are they a builder? Are they a designer? Are they good with software, hardware? Where do they fit in? So it gives them the opportunity to kind of see where they fit in and what they might like, what they don't like, and also um, get that first, I think, sense of how to work within the team. Maybe you're not always right. Your idea doesn't get um, selected all the time but they do get together and work. And for this competition, if they don't work as a team, they won't be successful. So the teams that are, are, are together and work and get to, you know, work hard together um, in a team environment, they are successful here. We're having a lot of fun. I mean, we're, it's just super enjoyable to watch this and we put a lot of work into it, a lot of ingenuity. I mean, the wheels at first were a gag and here we are, it's working. So just having a lot of fun. When students go on to enter the engineering workforce, it can be hard to decide what the best path forward is. And today we're speaking with JT Murti, who has an illustrious career in academia. She's one of the speakers at this year's meeting. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention, uh, she is the president of Oregon State University and we're in uh, the Beaver State. So it must be pretty nice to have this year's meeting here in the Northwest. How wonderful to have it here. I mean, it's such an honor to be hosting this amazing group of people here in Portland. Uh, you know, uh, Oregon is a tech state with Intel and with so many other semiconductor folks here. And so it's just a wonderful place to be. And you guys have brought good weather with you, so thank you <laughs> exactly. for that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I always say summers in the Northwest are the best in the world, but that's unbiased. Uh, I want to talk, how has engineering education changed throughout your career? Has it changed for the better in your opinion? Oh, I think it's absolutely changed for the better. There's no question about it. I mean, you know, people talk about whether the uh, you know, world is progressing or not. I would say that engineering is the one area where you can be truly hopeful about doing good in the world. I mean, you can't be problem solvers without, you know, being 
optimistic about the world and doing good in the world. I think uh, the coming of computer simulation has made industry so much more efficient. We, you, know, you don't have to build experiments to actually go figure out what an optimal design should be. That's one big plus. So the coming of AI is going to have very similar consequences. I think we've gotten so much more inclusive about who comes to engineering. You know, I was one of two women in my undergraduate class, all right? That's it. All, uh, you know, all areas combined, all engineering combined. Wow. There were 10 of us in the entire undergraduate program. You don't see that anymore. You know, I mean, we, you know, I wish our numbers were better, but they're inching up. Uh, you know, we see so many diverse people, so many women, so many folks from underrepresented communities. I think we're much more open for being there. The other way that engineering has changed is engineering has become much more transdisciplinary. So we understand that mechanical engineers can't just work in a little silo by themselves. They've got to work with the artists. They've got to work with the social sciences. They've got to work with public policy people. They've got to work with other engineers, scientists. That's a huge change, a big change in mindset. Now, uh, prior to going to OSU, you were the dean of the School of Engineering at UCLA. Yeah. So walk us through that transition of moving from faculty to administration. Oh boy, <laughs> what a change, what a change, right? You know, each role has its, its importance. So this is not to say one is more important than the other. I really don't think one is more important than the other. It's just taking on a different viewpoint and a different mindset. As a faculty member, I was really focused on teaching and research, all right? I, you know, I wanted to do big work. I wanted to make a big change in the world. Uh, and so I was deep and narrow rather than broad. And I was really focused on my students and getting them to be good. Uh, a dean role is broader. Uh, you got to think about engineering more broadly rather than just mechanical engineering or nanoscale heat transfer, whatever it is you're doing. Uh, and you have to think about uh, affordability for students, access for students, the success of faculty. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, physical infrastructure. So your viewpoint becomes broader and broader and broader, but you become less deep as you go along. <laughs> right? yeah. Well, President Murthy, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Enjoy the rest of the meeting, and may I say, go Beavers. Yeah, go Beavers. You can say that, absolutely. <laughs> and I can say that. Go Beavers. <laughs> And just like that, we're closing out another great episode of ASWE TV. If you want to revisit any of our content from today or yesterday, you can keep watching ASWE TV on screens around the Oregon Convention Center, in your room at select hotels, on the ASWE 2024 annual meeting website, and on YouTube and X, formerly known as Twitter. We're back for one final episode tomorrow. Before everyone heads home, we'll explore some innovative strategies and ideas to take your classrooms to the next level. I'm Joe Vithaythal, and we'll see you then.